join with us in our song service this morning. One of these days, these old kind of virus is going to be out of here, and there shall be showers of blessing. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing. Sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy comes round us of falling. But for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing. Precious reviving again. Next one is redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. Y'all sound good this morning, but I believe you can do a little bit better. Come on, let's sing. When the roll is called up yonder, y'all want to stand or you want to be seated? Stand up, let's sing. When the roll is called up yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal right and fair, when the same shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called 
may be seated. Okay, you get to thinking about that. Hey, hey chill. All right, now you got it. I want you to listen to this song. It's an old song, and I enjoy trying to sing it. It touches my heart every time I I sing it, and I, I hope it will you this morning. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. Still, if you'll open your Bibles up uh, to Exodus chapter 2, Exodus chapter 2, let's look at verses 23 through 25. Exodus chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 23 through 25. You know, in the midst of everything, <laughs> you know, I get lots of these YouTube videos sent to me every week. And when I mean lots, I'm talking about it burns the phone up. And it's a lot about Bible prophecy and what some guy says or some person says and what somebody else says. Today, I even got one first thing this morning. And uh, 
it came from uh, my cousin down there in Louisiana, and it was a, 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 a taping of a, a, a business meeting in one of the cities in Florida. And in that business meeting, they opened up with prayer. And in the very beginning, you'll notice the, the several people uh, get up and they walk out of this business meeting in, in this town in Florida. And the reason was is because they opened their business meeting up uh, praying to Satan in a, in a public thing. See, it was Satan, Allah, uh, Christa, uh, they said Jesus in there, and they, there's a whole bunch of different names. And, you know, and of course, everybody's shocked that that happened. And uh, I'm not really shocked. I'm disappointed. It's really hurt. It really hurts because it just shows you just how we're drifting away. And in my perspective, I, I see it as the, the family of God uh, not standing up uh, for the cause of the true and living God. Uh, not just getting ugly with it, but just, just approaching and witnessing the people more. I believe one of the biggest failures we've had is in raising our children and our grandchildren and, and the different ones. Uh, even, even in my age group, uh, the majority of people uh, attended church, but they didn't have a close relationship with Jesus Christ uh, to the point that it would change anything in their life. It was just a religious action. I mean, it wasn't a, a true relationship with Jesus Christ that showed up. Because when Jesus comes into your life truly, there's a transformation that takes place. Now, one of the things with everything that I see, including what I see with that city up there and with all the burnings and all that stuff, everybody watches all the time. I really don't watch that stuff. Is I know this, is that God is still on the throne. I know that no matter what you're seeing or, or, or what perspective you're looking at it, look at it through the eyes of Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, take on yourself that God has a plan. Now, this is hard because we always want to take control of the situation. We, we want to always put our two cents in there. But people are living in so much fear today. And I'm going to tell you, 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 all you can do is what you can do. You can still, uh, you can still catch it. You can catch this, this disease. You could be, you know, get really sick with it. You could. Uh, and you can also get healed in the name of Jesus Christ. You can get better. Uh, you can't walk and live in fear. You've got to live in the understanding that you're doing the best. When you've done all you can do, you've done all you can do. And, and let God be in control. And understand that God said that he has a plan for our lives. If we are surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ, he has a plan. Now, I may not like that plan. Because I can't see the future, I can't tell everything, but God knows it. And because he knows the plan, and he wants to bless us and not curse us, if I just say, okay, Lord, it's in your hands. Laying back, you've heard me preach it a million times. God has a providential plan for every person sitting here and those who are able to watch on their computers today. In the name of Jesus, I pray that they can hear this today through their computers. Everybody's doing the best they can. God has a plan. And if you're his child, then he has something for you. So as we look at these scriptures today, I, I want to just take a look. And, and really, if you'd read all the way from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 2, verse 25, you'll see God's providential plan even for the tribe of Israel. So I want to go back, look at this scriptures, and we've been using a lot of this about Egypt here lately, and let's look at God's plan for his people. If you could stand with me just a moment as we read God's holy word, if you're physically able, if you're physically able. It says, now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage. And they cried out, and they and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. And that's something really important there. 
let us use that as our opening scriptures. Father, we thank you so much, God, that you take notice of your people. And that, Father, we're not out of your sight. We're not out of, of anything dealing with you. Because, Lord, we know that you've got the whole world in your hands. I pray today, in the name of Jesus, that your spirit would speak to each one of our hearts. That we would receive the good news of God's plan. And, Lord, go forth with the boldness as Christians, knowing that you will direct our paths as we surrender unto you. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. You may be seated. So when we look at the experiences of God's people in Egypt right here, it teaches so many truths. It teaches so much because it shows us that God has a plan. It's always been since the very beginning of time before time. God had a plan for each one of us. We look at our lives and we feel so minute, we feel so unnoticeable that sometimes we just don't realize that we're in God's plan as we surrender our lives. So one of the greatest traits of God is knowing of his providence that his control. God took care of Israel from the very first moment that they were uh, in Egypt uh, and, and until their movement out of Egypt. And it was hard to believe because when you look at this, this deals with hundreds and hundreds of years right here. J Jacob's family, when we go back in Scripture, they came to Egypt to escape the famine that was in the land. Now, they didn't want to go there, but they had to because there wasn't any food. And so they, they, they were over there, and, and Canaan land was, was suffering at that moment. So here it is, though. We see where they're reunited with Joseph. That, now, this is the son of Jacob who had been sold into slavery, right, by his own brothers, right? We discussed this just a few weeks ago and stuff. And Joseph had became this high political figure standing in Egypt. He was well known. He, he, he was a person of, of great power. And the Pharaoh liked him so much that he gave Joseph the land of Goshen. And this was a land of plenty. This was a land of abundance. And it was blessed. And, and that, that Pharaoh had gave it to him as a permanent residence. He said, you know what? We like you so much. We just want you to come and live amongst our people right here. So just I want you to think about this. And for several years, the Israelites, they, they were over there and they prospered and multiplied. God had his hand upon them. And he was taking care of them. But after Joseph's death, after this great leader of God ha had passed away, there was another Pharaoh who had came into power. And he didn't recognize Joseph the way the other Pharaoh did. And he started forgetting about how God had blessed these people. And as he looked at them, he started looking at them as a threat to his position and his power. He started thinking, you know what? Uh, they, these guys right here, they're growing too much because God had multiplied them. They had a lot of sheep. They had a lot of uh, children. That they're, they're, they were being just growing vastly. And so what he did, he says, you know what I'm going to do? Just to make sure that they don't get too powerful, I, and just remember that, that, that I is one of the biggest problems we always have because we deal with it too. But he, he saw himself, he says, you know what? I'm going to put them under my thumb. I'm going to take control of them, and I'm going to put them into a forced labor camp, basically. I'm going to enslave them right there. So the good life of Israel that had been blessed, their families are multiplied, all of a sudden was placed into a position of where they were disappointed. All of a sudden, this life that had been a land of plenty... When they became slaves, guess what? Everything they own, everything they possess belonged to who? The Pharaoh. All of a sudden, they start looking at us like, oh my goodness, look at what I've lost. Look at, look, 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 look at what's taking place. I, I went from the owner of land to now I'm the one who works the land, and I don't even, uh, I'm not even blessed from the, uh, having this land. I, I wasn't able to sell it. I wasn't able to pass it to my children. But when you look at this, you look at how God's providence in the past years, how he had taken care of them, that they had experienced this marvelous care of God, and now they were going through a hard time. And what happened? All of a sudden, they lost sight of what God was doing. All of a sudden, because they were going through a, a difficult time, they lost sight that God loved them. So during this this atrocious period, this, this time where, where they were under this arrogant Pharaoh who's putting them under their thumb, God just still displayed himself as God who ultimately takes care of his people. 
Who, who's the one who will provide the way? See, the whole providence of God prevails over the people who trust him. Now, it's easy to trust him when everything's going easy and everything's going good and all the temperature is right and all the fields are plenty and everything, you know, we've got abundance, abundance, abundance. It's so easy to lay back and trust him. But what happens when it starts getting hot? What happens when it starts getting difficult? What happens when it looks like, it looks like the world's out of control? So do we have any experiences like that today? Do we see anything that's even similar? Well, we have a time where we're living where we see a disease and everybody says one thing, but it seems not to be so. Well, we live in a time where there could be a economic difficulties on the horizon. We live in a time where, where there's diseases that are, are coming to our community. We live in a time where life seems so, on a, uh, this, it, it could go either way. So if we understand that God's providence prevails over the people who say, I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Father. I don't understand what's going on. I, I, I don't know what's taking place. I trust you, Lord. So when you take a look at some of the insights about the providence of God, when you start taking these scriptures right here, all of a sudden you see something that, that enlightens us. And that's why God's word is for us today. He wants to show you. He wants to show, he's speaking to us through his holy word. See, God's providence endures across all. Multitude, multitude of ages of time. It, it, it stretches out. Often, as, as things are going on, as time starts passing, it seems like God has forgotten his people. And sometimes we feel that way. As we go in through difficulty and time starts lapsing day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, what takes place? We grow weary. Look at this COVID. How long has this stuff been going on now? What's that, March? Since March, what is that? Well, really before that, but that's when we, we kind of knew about it, right? So it's been going on for a while because it comes from Wuhan or whoever it is, China, whatever. But when it started coming in here, that's what? See, March, April, May. That's five months. In five months, have any of you said, man, I'm so sick of this disease? Have any of you said, I'm just fed up? I'm tired of this. He's, we're, we're like that, right? It's only natural. It, when we're in pain, when we're suffering, when we're going through hard times, we grow weary. That day-to-day -day existence of bondage, what it does is it, it wears us out. So look at Israel. Israel had been in bondage, what, 500 years? Now, what would you do in that situation? See, it's the care of God, it was so apparent to them with when they look at Jacob and his sons, when, when they were united with Joseph, Jacob's family could easily detect the care of God. They were seeing this blessing over Joseph. They were seeing the need being met. They could see God's care of them as he led them uh, to, to Egypt, and they had this great big family reunion, and all of a sudden they had all this favor with, with the people in high positions. But then something starts taking place. The family of Jacob started changing. Jacob's children, they belonged to the family of God. But inevitably, what they did is they wondered if God really cared for them because their circumstances had changed. Their circumstances had went from them being owners of the property to being property that was owned. They had became the slave. And, and they had heard about God's care for their family, just like a lot of our children or, or grandchildren or great-grandchildren. But all of a sudden, God was apparently, they believed in their hearts, silent as they were in bondage in Egypt. Five months. Have you felt like your prayers are hitting the wall? Five months. Have you felt like you just don't know if God cares about you? Have you been going through depression? Have you been going through hardships? See, during the critical times in the lives of God's people, uh, often we feel 
that God is silent. When we're really sick, when we're really in hardships, when we're really going through tough times, often we feel like during these times of injustices that we didn't deserve this, that we, w- w- this shouldn't happen to us. That's when we, we wish God would come and act now. He would act immediately. Set me free. I want you to go back and think about when they were first put into slavery. Day after day. Week after week they prayed. Month after month. Year after year. And as I was looking at it, I was wondering, at what point do we stop believing? At what point do we become just that individual who our our relationship is really showing up in who we are in our walk with Christ? All of a sudden, we start drifting away. We're not singing with Brother Raymond anymore because... The bird has lost its song. All of a sudden, we feel like we're in this cage. So the story of of bondage, of Israel's bondage right here, it it demonstrates that God works in his time. Hundreds of years had passed, yet God still was going to work. Five months. It is a long time. We all feel it. But sometimes I think we just don't have much toughness in us. Whew, I'll get in trouble now. I don't think we're that tough spiritually. I don't think we've developed any endurance in our spiritual walk with God. See, in God's providence, he didn't deliver them with the first cry, Lord, help us, we've been enslaved. Lord, help us. We're going through trouble. God works and moves in his way and in his time. Raymond, how many times are you saying that? In his time, in his time. He makes all things beautiful in his time. We sing those songs over and over, yet we do not understand time. God is infinite. God does not measure time the way that me and you do. And when he looks at our lives, I mean, our lives are so short But God hears his people. He may not act when I want him to. He may not jump when I say jump. When I say frog. Is God going to jump? When I get over here and I scream, I'm hurting. In his time because he sees from a different angle than I do. He sees from a perfect perspective. He sees what truly needs to be done. For hundreds of years, he was letting these people that were enslaved multiply. Because even though the Pharaoh had put them in bondage, their children just kept getting more and more. Even though they were killed and they were murdered, their people grew. Then he selected someone and he prepared a leader out of it. Now think, hundreds of years... He's letting them grow and grow and grow, and then he chooses one to be a leader. He makes sure that he is educated in all the different arts. He made sure that he was prepared and that his heart was after a Savior. See, sometimes in our lives, it it looks like God is silent. Sometimes in our lives, it, it, it seems like We don't understand if he's hearing me. Do do you hear me, Lord? Do do you know what I'm going through, Lord? But that whole time, he's always working. And I imagine if we would open up the floor, I believe in my heart that many of you could give a testimony that as you look back in time, that God was taking you all along the way, not in your time, Not when you desired it, because he had a plan. And he still has a plan today. (coughs) God is always working in our lives. And he inevitably works for his people. Those who say, Lord, just have your will and way. Lord, take me to where you want to take me. Lord, use me as you want to use me. So many times as as pastors, when we're, we're trained up in ministry... They always say, listen, 
Listen, don't look at what you see today as the end results of the seeds that you plant. Just remember, it's not about you, it's about God. You continue to plow, you continue to plant, and just know that the King of kings, that the Lord of lords, that you're glorifying the one who saved you, who transformed you, the one who took you out of bondage. In Exodus, and, you, and you, if you go back, you'd, you'd see these several verses in chapter 1, but God, it shows God's providence. It, it takes on, it withstands the assaults that are always coming against it. During, during the times of assault, the enemy seems so much stronger than God. When you're going through pain, misery, are you shouting victory in Jesus? When you're going through suffering in your, in your home or, or someone you love so dearly is, is going through a hardship, does it look like God is victorious there? Strange how we look at things. You see, even though Satan may seem stronger, when you hear about and you get these videotapes of some guy praying in the name of Satan, when you see people that are out there and it looks like they're in a position of power, they ain't in power. God might seem silent, but, but he's always working in my life and in your life. So when we look at this to, to the Israelites, Pharaoh's strength seems overwhelming. He had the chariots. He had the, most, he had the best arms. He had the, the most people that were trained to do battle. But when you start investigating it, when you start digging into this, what it shows us is that God's providence is stronger than any Pharaoh, any president, any, any, anybody else who claims some kind of kingship. The Savior has a plan. And when you look back in time, you see it. See, the Pharaoh's assaults on the Israelites was permitted, and I want you to listen to this, it was permitted by God. This ain't popular today. This, this won't be no uh, preaching in some of those large churches today. But he permitted, he permitted it. And during this persecution, the people groaned. They moaned with pain. And they started questioning God's strength and power. But I'm going to tell you what was taking place. There was a separation of goats and sheep. There was a separation of wheat and tares. And it's always going to be this way, y'all. There's, there's people out there today that are being persecuted as born-again believers being persecuted because as Christians they're being executed, they're being placed in prison, they're, they're being punished. They have to pay taxes all around the world. Yet they continue to worship our Savior. I look at us today, and you, how many times have you heard preachers say, the church of Christ always prospers the most when? When it's persecuted. Well, it'll be growing like wildfire. But then, what's the definition of growth? You see, when we look at this word, we see something right here. God was taking these people that was questioning his power, and he's going to take it and use them for a purpose. See, the Pharaoh, now he comes up with three different methods, of, and he's attacking them, and first thing he did is he wanted to break their spirit. And what he did is he starts taking them and, and these servants, and he places them into slavery. He says, this will, bust, this will bust them up. This, this will make sure that they're not able to do what they're called to do. Then the next thing you see is, is, is he tried to get the midwives to, to portray their own blood and, and tell when tr children were born. And, and then you see the, the third thing he tries to do is destroy all the male children born. All these Hebrews, all of it is trying to attack and attack and attack and attack. You're seeing multitudes of attacks in different directions. And it's the same thing that takes place with the church today. There's a multitude of attacks right now. They'll, they'll say, if you, if you preach out the, the whole gospel of Jesus Christ, that you're a bigot. If you go over here and you say that this is a sin, uh, that you don't understand what living is. Everything is, if, if you don't hire people that, that, that don't have the same convictions of the church, they're going to sue you. 
if you have a bakery and, and it's against your, your belief to, to, to make a, a wedding cake that deals with homosexual marriage, uh, that they're going to sue you and take your business. If you don't rent to somebody who, who's living in, in sin and, and, and they're, they're, they're committing sin and, and you say, well, I'm not going to rent to them because I have a, a spiritual conviction, then you can be sued also. All of it is to break down the image of God in your heart. All of it is to make you feel weak. All of it is to make you question, is my God still in control? So as you're looking out there, as you're sitting out there today, who do you believe is in power? I'm telling you, it doesn't matter the laws they passed. Pharaoh passed a lot of laws. Pharaoh did a lot of terrible things to the people of God. But God's people were still under his control. Now, they didn't like it. It didn't feel good. And that's where we got to get some, some alligator hide, y'all. We got to toughen up. See, it's easy to stand up and shout Jesus when everybody's shouting with you. It's easy to preach behind a pulpit in the middle of a Baptist church. But will you do the same when it's not accepted? Will you do the same when people won't stand with you? See, God is stronger than any other force, any plague. God is still in control. It says that many shall say, Lord, Lord, but few shall enter in. It says that the way is narrow that goes to heaven. It says throughout the scripture, there's going to be many who say, Lord, I cast out demons in your name. Lord, I did this in your name. He's going to say, I don't know who you are. When our heart is sold out to Jesus Christ, there is no turning back from that faith that even after hundreds and hundreds of years or 2,000 years and Christ has not returned, we still follow him. The good shepherd, uh, the one who, who gives us the victory, the one who says, I prepared a place for you. It doesn't matter what everybody else says. What matters is where your heart is. What matters is what your belief truly built upon. What matters is, are you walking according to the word of God, trusting him? Saying, I don't care what takes place. I'm going to walk through the fire because Jesus will be right there with me. You see, the Exodus story, what it does is it demonstrates God's ultimate power. There's another Exodus story coming up, y'all. There's another Exodus story coming. Could be any day. And there's going to be a, sh a shout. And there's going to be a trump. And there's going to be people that will be leaving this world. A rapture will take place. And I'm telling you what, it's going to be greater than any Exodus <laughs> anyone has ever experienced before because the children of God sold out for Jesus are going to be called up in the rapture and I'm telling you then they're going to really find out what bad is then they're going to really find out what the plagues are what the woes are hold on to Jesus hold on to the truth of the word of God when you look back in scripture and it talks about these midwives as Shipra and, and Pua she, they expressed their, their total faith in God, and they refused to obey the Pharaoh's command to kill the Hebrew children. Now think, if they would not have been obedient, what would have happened to Moses? Now, won't you remember, so you see that story, jump over there to Jesus Christ. If Mary would not have been obedient to the will of God. All throughout, we're seeing the plan of God, and I'm telling you, it wasn't comfortable. In Jesus' day, the king orders all the male children a certain age to be executed. You go back over here to this day, and we're seeing where all the male children in a certain age group are being killed. 
But each time there was somebody who says, I'm not going to listen to what anybody says. I'm going to follow the truth of the Word of God. I'm going to follow the plan of God. I know that He has a purpose and a plan for me. When, when you're confusing your, your religion with your faith, you got problems. See, your relationship with Christ is for better, for worse. It's kind of like marriage. So when, when your spouse gets sick, do you dump them on the wayside? I'm not saying you won't feel like it sometimes, but I'm saying, do you dump them? For better, for worse. God says he's always got it better for us. But he didn't say there wasn't going to be some hardships along the way. When we, when we trust in God, like these two individuals, and they refuse to do it, even under the threat. Now, see, that if the Pharaoh would have executed them, he wouldn't just been them. One thing about them people back then, they would have killed everybody in their family. But they trusted God. So the question comes back to do we trust God? So when you look at Moses' birth account, and, and what you do is you start realizing that there's the unseen forces of God at work during the whole time. There's no logical human explanation for the events surrounding Moses' birth and his life. Everything says it shouldn't have took place. But God's providence defies all human explanation. God is taking and creating this miracle in the midst of a storm. So since the call of, of Abram out of Ur, of, of the Chaldees, God had a special purpose for Israel according to the Scripture. And during the years of the patriarchs, he worked out a plan. And all those plans are, being, are showing up right here before our very eyes. All these plans are right. Well, God's plan of deliverance seemed to, to, to be reduced by this, this slender thread. When you look at it, just a, a tiny baby set adrift on a river full of crocodiles and, and, and them um, hippopotamuses and, and all sorts of dangers, the currents. How could it be that in this, this fragile basket, this little bitty baby that God was going to execute his intention through the most unlikely of prospects that he was going to take an individual and he was going to deliver his people. So when I look at this, I look at these scriptures, the, the events surrounding the birth of Moses was filled with all this strange working of God. So do I understand everything going on today? No. No. All I know is that God gave me a promise. And he's going to work it out. That he's going to be glorified in it. I accept that. Does that mean I could get sick? Sonny could get sick. We ain't sick yet. Could we get sick? Yeah. We could. But God has a plan. Do I accept the will of God? I pray that God would be glorified in me in every part of my life. God, what he did is he preserved a baby that was going to be murdered. And he saw to it that Moses was discovered by the Pharaoh's daughter. Now, what's the odds of that, y'all? And then he provided Joshebeth, Moses' biological mother, to oversee him as he grew up. She reared him. She took care of him. So you've got to see God's hand here. Do you see God's hand? So many times it's, it's hard for us to see it, but it's right there. It, it, it defies all explanation. It defies, if you were to sit down with people, of a, I, I sit with people that are non-believers and I tell them this story, they would think it was all made up. They would think it was all just a bunch of fairy tales. And that's why they live in distress. You see, we can't be overwhelmed with trouble. We cannot let 
fear overtake us. Because God says, I will take care of you. Do you know that? Is that in your heart? He told me that he'd provide strength. And that we, he'll, we'll experience his unseen power at work through every part of our lives that we just look. When you look at your life today, could you give testimony to somebody next to you about how God has taken you from where you were to where you're at today? Was it all just great and gravy train and everything was easy? Or was God taking you through things so that your faith might be stretched? So that your trust might grow? So that your obedience to His will might be laid at His feet? When you look at it, can you trust Him? Can you obey Him? He's never fallen short, and he never will. What the world needs today is believers that won't criticize everybody else, but will share the trust of Jesus, that they will share their testimonies, that they will say, only by the grace of God do I stand before you. It's a miracle that some preacher like me would be allowed to testify to you. But by the grace of God, He's taken me through it all. He took me through the waters. He's took me through the fire. He's took me through plagues and diseases. He's taken me from when I was told I was going to die and everything else. He's taken me. And I know that I will not go one moment before the God says, it's my time. And when he does, <laughs> he's promised me he's prepared a place for me. And he's promised me that where he is, I'll be also. I hope you'll be there. I hope you'll be standing with the saints of God, shouting to, to the glory of Jesus Christ, saying, he lives, he lives. <laughs> Thank God Almighty, he lives. We need to be a testimony hope you'll join me today if you've never made a decision for Jesus Christ and you've been living in fear you've been living in all sorts of fear why don't you want to trust him don't you want to say Jesus I trust you will you forgive me of my sins and save me save me Lord I need you he'll do it he promised it in the word Maybe you're a born-again believer and, and Satan's been beating you up with all sorts of stuff. And he's got you just in, in just a, a tizzy, just, just running around, not knowing what to do. Stop. Get on your knees. Cry out to Jesus. Just as he heard his children before, he'll hear you. Trust him. He's got a plan. If you bow your heads just a moment today. As they're playing an altar call song today. These altars are open. I want to invite you to come and pray. Or you can pray where you're sitting at. Pray for your neighbors and your friends. Pray that your life will glorify Jesus Christ. And if you haven't made that decision for Jesus, or maybe you've just been playing church for a while, why don't you really look at your life, really examine it, and make sure you're glorifying God. I want to challenge you. Why don't you step out? Get things right with God. Why don't you come this morning?
dream.